So I got to uh, feel like I need to at least explain a little bit about our service this morning and uh, this opportunity for us to be together here uh, this morning. Uh, one of the things that every so often uh, happens is uh, miscommunication or something of that nature. And uh, we were supposed to have a guest pastor here this morning, uh, but Pastor Jason called me last night uh, just as we were getting ready to sit down for dinner. And I looked and I, I usually kind of ignore phone calls. Uh, when um, dinner time is about to happen, but, but I saw it said, uh, Pastor Jason Lumpkin, and I thought to myself, huh. <laughs> you just ever have that feeling when you see someone call or you see their name show up on your phone, and I just kind of thought, I, I got to answer this one. <laughs> and of course, uh, he, he was on the other line, and uh, he actually, we, we, Miss Rebecca and I got on together. There were three of us on the phone call, and we were just kind of uh, contemplating and thinking. And, and before uh, we'd even really gone through and he even had a chance to ask, I said, Pastor, it sounds like to me somebody needs to fill the pulpit in the morning. And he kind of chuckled, and I said, hey, we got you covered. You go back, you enjoy your vacation, uh, you in, and spend this time with your family. There's no need to worry. We're going to get you covered, and uh, that's what we're doing this morning. And uh, so it, it's kind of nice to have resources, uh, different people to be able to step in and in really a moment's notice, get called in from the bullpen, <laughs> maybe called up from AAA. I, I don't know, whatever example you want. And uh, hey, you're the starter tonight. <laughs> so here we are, and uh, we're going to make it work. But one of the things that I think about, and uh, just the, the privilege, uh, the, the joy of being able to, to look around and to, to call Lovebridge my church. Does that make sense? To be able to say, this is... I look forward to this. I look forward to being able to come together in fellowship with one another. I look forward to the things that, that we do collectively as a church body, those moments and times of fellowship, the, the bringing of ourselves together intentionally, uh, to, to whether it's to learn, to grow, to fellowship, to, to just get to know each other. Um, I, I, I'm just excited. I'm excited about what God's doing in our midst. I'm excited that, that God has chosen to bring us together. And one of the things that I look back uh, at and I think about in my life um, is just that prayer, just that moment, that opportunity that's kind of in the back of, of our minds. And in my mind, I'd always wanted to be a part of a church that was busy about reflecting God's kingdom. I don't know about you. Look around. What do you see? Do you see diversity? Do you see different ages, different backgrounds, different cultures? Do you see opportunities for maybe different types of ministries? You see, that excites me. I don't know about you, but that's something that I've always wanted to be a part of. I've always wanted to be a part of a church where different languages could be spoken at any moment. I've always wanted to be a, a part of a church where uh, there were old and there were young and there were uh, different races and different ethnicities and different cultural perspectives. And we, we come together in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a lot of things out there that say, oh, you're supposed to be divided. You're supposed to have different perspectives and thoughts and, and political persuasions and, and all of those other things. But I think it's great to be a part of a church where we come together under the banner of God's truth, where the gospel is proclaimed, where the people are diverse, where there's opportunity to serve, where there's a hunger for growth, not just individual growth spiritually, but also growth as a church and yet we have a burden for our community. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that exciting. And I find the things that we are a part of, yeah, that's, that's worthy of a clap right there. I find the things that we've been a part of, you know, I look back even over the last couple of three months, uh, preparation for vacation Bible school, uh, moving and doing something a little bit different where we went off campus and did a, a big vacation Bible school kickoff over at Legion Park. Man, that wore us slap out. But you know what was most encouraging about that? Is I look around and just about everybody in this room was a part of that. 
You see, we have a desire to grow. We have a desire to work together. We have a desire to reach into our community. And I couldn't help but think as I was thinking about these things and, and, and thinking, now, Lord, where are we leading? Where, where are you leading uh, this message this morning? And, and Philippians just, just had to be. So if you'll turn in your Bibles this morning to Philippians chapter 1, we're going to look in verse number 3. We're going to look at verses 3 through 11. I'm just going to read that. We're going to camp out there in Philippians chapter 1 this morning. And I want us to see some aspects of, of being encouraged and wanting to grow and what it is that God is doing in our midst this morning. And so Philippians chapter 1. Now, uh, Miss Rebecca and I were talking after Wednesday night's uh, study uh, and uh, we're, we're still um, gingerly approaching the New Living Translation. Is that an accurate statement? <laughs> However, I'm going to preach from the New Living Translation this morning. Uh, we we kind of come from a different, maybe, your New King James has come to something I had always preached out of. Uh, I don't know what version or what Bible translation you have, but I just, it's most encouraging to say, you've got a Bible that you can bring your scriptures, you can, uh, whether they're going to be projected here, you can look on your phone, you can open your Bible. And so as we're wa working and walking through this scripture, uh, whatever version you have, we're going to pull it all together here this morning. And so Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 3, and this is what it says. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Verse number 7. So it is all, it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you. For you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in the defending and confirming of the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and how I long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Verse 9 says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruits of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. I'm going to talk this morning about growing together and how that growth really reflects the scriptures that we read here in Philippians. You see, amidst all the, the good things that we've kind of referred to this morning, amidst uh, being able to gather together and, and worship and, and being able to fellowship together, we also need to make sure that continues that we're always looking and seeking further growth and further opportunities. And so three things this morning, uh, straight out of those scriptures. The first thing that I want us to see is that we grow together in fellowship. That we grow together in fellowship. Now, the question would be here is, what is fellowship? Is fellowship uh, a lunch? Is fellowship a gathering? Uh, is, is fellowship something that you do in other places at other times? Um, I always laugh at how we kind of use terms in church. Uh, do you ever go to work fellowships? Or do we usually kind of only use that as a church term? Can't see where I'm going with that. <laughs> uh, there, there's something about the word fellowship that we associate as the body of Christ. But I believe there's a reason for that. The Greek word for fellowship here is actually koinonia. And, and it is a very specific word that carries with it a spiritual connection. It's a spiritual partnership, if you will. 
And so, have you ever looked and realized and thought that as we gather together as Love Bridge Church, that we're in a spiritual partnership with one another? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that a partnership requires two or more people to come together, and, and really, without one, we're incomplete? You ever thought about that? Ever thought that if, if maybe you weren't here this morning, that our fellowship, our partnership wouldn't be complete? Now, a lot of times we kind of wake up and we think, well, I guess I'll go to church this morning. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'll do, you know, no, I, I think we have to realize and understand that when we're here together, that we are in partnership with one another. And that it's deeper than just a friendship. It's more than just gathering together for the sake of being together. That there's something about a partnership together in Christ that is foundational to our faith. You can't do this by yourself. You can't go alone and expect to grow in your faith in Christ. And so we have to come together. We have to understand the need and the want and the desire to fellowship with one another. Now, that doesn't mean it's always perfect. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we're the perfect place to come together. Yeah, we got our warts, too. I, I know it's probably <clears throat> not something we'd like to talk about, right? <laughs> but that's the way it is. And so in this partnership, we recognize the strengths, the weaknesses, the spiritual gifts that we all bring to the table. And we realize that, you know what? God needs us. And, and, and he used, let me refer to that, he uses us. We need one another. We need to come together as a spiritual partnership. A couple of things on how we can grow together in this fellowship. Look at verse number three. Paul says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Do you ever go to the Lord in prayer and just say, Lord, thank you for Daryl. Thank you for Ryan. Thank you for Miss Marie. Thank you for Rebecca. Do you ever pause in our prayers and we, we start thinking and naming those people in our fellowship? Do we ever have that moment where we say, Lord, thank you for the relationships that we have here? at Love Bridge Church. See, that's one of the aspects of this spiritual partnership is that we go together and we pray together and we're thankful for one another. But he also says in verse number four, Paul continues, he says, whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with what? Joy. You kind of see how those go together. I'm thankful for each and every one of you. And so I joyfully pray for you. We joyfully pray for one another. We joyfully seek those opportunities to fellowship together and to grow together. And so how do we grow in our fellowship? Well, we pray for each other in thanksgiving and in joy. But notice in verse number five, he also brings in a different thing. He says, what has he been praying for? He says, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. What is our ultimate purpose in gathering as a church? Is it just for our own benefit? Or were we given a commission to go share, to preach, the good news. You see, the ultimate fulfillment of our fellowship together is that we're also partnering in the proclamation of the gospel, taking forth the good news as God has gifted us and resourced us to do. And so how do we grow in our fellowship? Well, we pray in thanksgiving and joy. 
We seek opportunities to partner together in the proclamation of the gospel. But then verse number 6, Paul says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, he will do what? He will continue it. And so a lot of times in our fellowship, we just say, God, <laughs> here we are. You continue to work. Isn't that joyful? Isn't there a lot of pressure that's kind of removed at that point? Um, you know, I, I think about leaders within the church, and, and I think about, again, how all of us collectively work together. But one of the things that I'm most thankful for is that when we come together, um, as someone who represents a portion of the leadership of this church, I don't have the pressure to worry about things. Does that make sense? That I don't have to sit here and go, oh, man, if I don't show up today... Church ain't going to happen. <laughs> what would it be like if that's what we were worried about? There's, a, there's a, a freedom in our fellowship that just says, God, you do the work. We're here. We're journeying together. We're in this thing we call fellowship, and we're going to trust that you will continue to work. I am certain Paul says that God, who began the good work within you, he will do what? He will continue his work until it is fully finished on the day when Christ returns. Now, in other words, until that day, we have a task, do we not? And that task involves fellowship with one another, to grow together joyfully and thankfully, to partner with the proclamation of the gospel, and to allow God to to work. I think about my family and uh, just the aspect of how this is really our family, the Lovebridge family. You know, my, my oldest daughter, she graduated uh, high school uh, back in May. And as most parents would tell you, uh, if you have, if you're a parent, you will completely understand what I'm about to say. Time flies. Does it not? <laughs> you look up, and that little firstborn baby that I used to hold and go, Oh, Daddy's going to be here forever for you. I will not allow anything to happen to you. You're so perfect, my love. <laughs> Boom. 18 years old. Talks back. <laughs> has become her own person. Yet the beauty of that, the, the, the thanksgiving that I have to watch my children grow, to become their own person, to struggle through life because we all struggle, to grow together, to watch ourselves as a family grow through trials and, and heartache and circumstances, yet find ourselves still trusting God. Growth requires patience, does it not? Growth requires the, the maturing process of becoming uh, from a baby into an adult. Growth is part of that process that we're all going through and we will all continue to go through as we learn, as we grow, as we love, as we mature, as we find ourselves patiently working alongside each other. So our fellowship is a partnership, and we're growing in that partnership. And so that's how we keep on doing what God has called us to do. We grow together in fellowship. But there's a second part of that too. Notice here in Philippians, notice in verse number seven, there's an aspect of not just fellowship, but there's also grace. Okay? And so the second thing that we see here is that we grow together in grace. Notice verse number seven says, So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. Notice the next part there. He says, you share with me the special favor of God. Does anyone's translation actually use the word grace there? See, grace is God's special favor upon us. 
God's favor directed not just at me individually, but also us collectively. When we come together as Love Bridge Church, we are the focus of God's grace. We are the focus of Christ's love. We are the focus of, of, of his desire to work in us. We are the focus of his favor. You ever thought about that? That God himself said, this is my body of believers right here. This, th these are the people of my special favor. That's a pretty incredible place to be. And yet we grow in that grace. How do we grow in this grace? Well, again, in verse number 7, he says that I should feel as I do about you all, for you have what a special place in my heart. You see, grace begins right here in our hearts. It begins with that understanding of God. You have cultivated salvation in my soul. You have brought me from death and placed me into life. You have taken my sin and you have cast it as far as the east is from the west. You have breathed into me the very life of Christ himself. And so we recognize right here in our hearts that we are the focus of God's grace. That we are the focus of God's passion and forgiveness in us. But then we also rec recognize something else. If I have that, and then we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, what do I see in your hearts? The same thing. That I realize that God has brought us from different backgrounds and from different perspectives and from different struggles and sin natures, and yet he's wiped the slate clean. And he says, you are my special people. And God has called us into his grace. And it starts right here in our own hearts. But notice there's a second aspect of grace. And, and I'm going to kind of maybe camp out a little bit here on something. Sometimes we approach grace as, it's, as if it's this touchy, feely, weak feeling, okay? But notice here how Paul is sharing in grace. What does he say here? You share with me the special favor of God. How? In my imprisonment. How gracious is imprisonment? Well, Paul understood it. In both my imprisonment and in the defending and confirming of the truth of the good news. Have you ever thought about grace being that place where we actually stand on God's truth? You see, the world kind of says, well, grace is love and love is acceptance. And acceptance means anything is allowable. Well, that's the world. What does God say? What does his truth say? What does his grace say? You see, grace is grounded in truth. Grace is grounded in that which we know is God's truth to us. And notice he, he uses some terms here. He says, you share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment, in what? In defending. The word for defense there in the Greek is apologia. It's where we get the word apologetics, which is kind of a study, if you will, of the knowledge of how to defend and proclaim the gospel in maybe an antagonistic situation. Have you ever thought about grace? and defending the gospel in the same place? Paul does. 
for some reason, we kind of have it in our minds sometimes that being gracious and being defensive of God's truth can't kind of exist in the same place. But yet, it does. And so we see here, grace is grounded in truth. The defense of the faith. The confirming of that truth. He also says here, in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. The word confirming there literally means to be established. So we establish the grounds of God's gospel. We say, look, Jesus himself says what? There is no other way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. When Peter and John were preaching in the book of Acts, they didn't say, oh, just however you want to be saved. They said, no, salvation is found in no other. There's no other name under heaven and earth given by which man must be saved except to the name of Jesus Christ. We establish the truth of the gospel, the truth of who Christ is, fully God yet fully man. The truth of the fact that all of us have a sin nature. And that all of us, by virtue of who we are as Adam's descendants, the human race, we are sinners. And that sin separates us from God. But we also establish the fact that Christ died for sinners. And that while we were still in our sin, what the Bible says, Christ died for us. That we have the opportunity to seek forgiveness, the forgiveness of Christ. Now the world may say what? Uh, you're good. You don't need a Savior. <laughs> you're fine just the way you are. And the Bible says what? No, that's not correct. And it's hard sometimes, is it not? It's hard to carry the truth of the gospel into those places that don't always want to hear. But you know what? We do it with grace. We do it with God's favor in our hearts and in our lives. So how do we go grow in grace? Well, it begins in our hearts. It's grounded in truth. Grace is also strength. Grace is boldness. Grace is being able to stand in the face of opposition to the gospel. All of that is grace. But it also is, in verse number 8, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. You see, grace is wanting to not just stand on truth just because. Grace is not standing on truth harshly. Grace is not standing on truth without love. Grace is not standing on truth with a desire to offend. Grace is standing on truth with the desire to be affectionate and compassionate to one another and to others. Are we growing in grace? It seems like as a church, and, and I say this in a very general sense, it seems like churches are, are good at one of two things. <laughs> We're either good at truth at no costs, or no, you know, you, you know what I mean by that? Like it's like we're going to stand on the truth regardless. And, and we kind of become offensive about it, don't we? It, it, it's almost like, hmm, I, I don't want that. We want the truth. Or the other side is sometimes it's, it's, it, we play into this thing, again, kind of the opposite side of what we're looking at with grace here, but, but this acceptance at any cost. Oh, whatever you want, however you feel, come on in. And we don't ever proclaim that which is true. But if we're going to grow in grace, we've got to do both, don't we? We've got to know the truth. We've got to understand the gospel. And we've got to seek to love, be compassionate to others, both in our midst and within our community. And so we grow together. We're growing in fellowship. We're growing in grace. But we also want to grow together, here's the third thing, in righteousness. And we're going to make this real quick here. In verse number 9, 
He says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and in understanding. And so righteousness here is this aspect of growing in love. Verse 9, your love. You know what the word for love there is? There's three different types of love that are mentioned in the New Testament. But the Greek word for this place, and this love, is agape. The unconditional aspect of love. And so as we're growing in righteousness, we're growing in unconditional love for each other, for others around us. Is it hard to love unconditionally? <laughs> All right. For those of you who are married, look next to you. <laughs> look at your spouse <laughs> and tell me, I love you unconditionally all the time. It doesn't always work that way, does it? We have feelings. We have emotions. We have struggles. We have frustrations. We, we go through those things where we're like, Ugh, I just don't feel that I love you. But yet we establish a fact that what? We do love unconditionally. Does that make sense? So it's more than just a feeling. It's more than just that, that feeling of like, well, I kind of love today, but not so much tomorrow. You see, we establish a fact that, you know what? We do love. And we're in this. We're going to work through things. We're going to uh, be with one another. And so as we're growing together, we also grow together in that unconditional love for each other. That means that if we sometimes have disagreements... We don't walk away from each other, do we? No. We're going to keep loving. We're going to keep serving. We're going to keep moving and growing together. So we grow in righteousness. I want to just kind of turn your attention. Go down to verse 11 here. It says, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. So we're kind of hanging our, our point on this morning is the fact that we are growing in that righteousness. And how do we grow in that righteousness? Well, we're looking for that place to grow in unconditional love. We're growing in knowledge and in understanding you also see that in verse number 9. It says, keep on growing in knowledge and in your understanding. The word there means literally to, to learn and discern. And so as we're learning God's truth, we understand how to discern that truth and apply it in practical ways around us. But notice he also says in pure, verse number 10, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live what? Pure and blameless. Sincere and non offensive. It's kind of the Greek rendering there. And so, what are characteristics of growth in righteousness? Unconditional love, growth in knowledge and understanding, pure and blameless living, filled with the fruit of salvation. Notice also, he says in verse 11, that you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. As Christ has saved us, we also proclaim that same message of forgiveness, of love, and of hope. And the last thing that it comes to, notice at the very end of verse number 11, for this will bring much, what? Glory and praise to God. We at Lovebridge have a unique calling. And I really just am excited to see how God works in us. The things that he's doing in our midst. The way he's bringing people with different backgrounds. But if, if we take our eyes off of God and we start trying to find things and nitpick against each other, we won't survive. We have a lot of opportunity before us. We have a lot of resources, a lot of talent, 
a lot of influence, a lot of opportunities. School starts back next week. One of the things that we do as a church is we go into our school systems, invited, by the way, by the school themselves at Garrett and also at Austell Elementary, where we are able to go in and pray. Now think about that for a second. God has opened up the door for us to influence our community. That's pretty awesome. And so we look around and we see opportunity. We see opportunity for growth. But we want to grow in the right way. Growing in fellowship. Growing in grace. Growing in righteousness. The invitation this morning is real simple. Do you want to grow at Lovebridge? Do you want to grow individually? Lord, here I am. But do you also want to see growth happen as a church to expand those opportunities to influence our community? Do you want to grow together as Love Bridge in fellowship, in grace, and in righteousness? There's so many opportunities, so many different things that, that, that just I see God doing in our midst. And I just feel like our task is to say, God, here we are. God, I want these things. I want to see your hand work in our church. That's the invitation this morning. To open up your heart and say, God, I want to see you move in our church. But also to pray, God, show us, open those doors, and allow us to faithfully serve you as Love Bridge Church. I ask that we would bow our heads, close our eyes for this time of prayer as we begin this invitation moment. God, there's so many opportunities around us. And God, we would pause now to say thank you for bringing us to this place, presenting us the challenge, the opportunity, but also the gifting, the resources, the love for one another to make a difference in all stale and beyond. God, I pray that we truly are a bridge of love into this community. God, I pray that we are committed to growth in fellowship and in grace and in righteousness. And God, that we look around and we see the opportunity to serve side by side in partnership with one another, for the proclamation of the gospel. God, that we would take this great commission that you've given us and we would go forth in your strength and power for the praise, for the glory of your name. Lord, we commit ourselves to you this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The invitation time is open for us to respond, whether we're in our seats, to come down here, maybe at the altar to pray. We'll have our prayer counselors here as well if you need to pray about certain specific aspects of maybe how God has touched your heart this morning. This is that time for us to respond to God's leading.